and welcome to the France Van Gat interview. I'm Marie Dundas in Brussels on the sidelines of the European Development Days, a two-day gathering of the world's leading development experts. Now, last September, an historic moment when the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, were adopted unanimously. But just because there's agreement on what needs to be done doesn't necessarily mean there's consensus on how we're going to get there, which is why I'm pleased to welcome my guest today, Isabella Lovin, Swedish Minister for International Development, Cooperation and Climate, as well as being Sweden's Deputy Prime Minister. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Now, ending poverty, gender equality, peace and justice, climate action, these are just some of the objectives we need to achieve by 2030, some say unattainable. How do we prioritise what needs to be done first? I don't, I don't think we should prioritise. I mean, that's the whole idea of this new agenda, that we have this integral agenda where we need to do this all at the same time. The world has tried before to address poverty, like in one silo, and environmental sustainability in another, but it, it, it doesn't work. We need to do this all together now. So we need to make sure the world has uh, availability of sustainable energy in order to, to meet the climate goal, but this will also help lifting people out of poverty. So today, more than one billion people don't have access to electricity at all. So why should they repeat the mistakes of the industrialized world and building big coal, plant, coal power plants and, and destroying the climate while they, when they can right, go straight away to renewable energy? And uh, we also know that the poorest countries in the earth, on the earth are the ones that are going to be hit the hardest by the warming climate. So small uh, developing island states are even threatened of being completely wiped out because of sea level rise, because of climate change. And uh, desertification, the warming of the climate is really uh, destroying arable air, uh, earth and, and, and uh, the conditions for food security. So we need to do this all at once. And I think that's the beauty of the new agenda, that the world has finally realized we need to do this together at once. And this provides also new opportunities and a chance for the world. And one of the most topical issues is, of course, refugees that will be tackled here over the next two days. Sweden has had a major policy, policy shift over the last six months. Could you explain the shift for us, the reasons behind it? So Sweden has had and uh, we will still have a very open policy when it comes to receiving people that are fleeing for their lives uh, because of war and persecution. So we need to respect the right to asylum and we're very, much, we're very firm on that. Last year we received 163,000 refugees in Sweden on a population of a little more than 9 million people. And we saw that uh, the majority of the refugees either chose to go to Germany or to Sweden and some to Austria. But we want to see a more solidaric European Union uh, and we want the same conditions to apply for refugees wherever they apply for asylum uh, in the European Union. And we need all the member states to take responsibility. So Sweden's tired of bearing a disproportionate burden. What we did was to really shift the standards for receiving refugees to, uh, let's say, the, the minimum of the EU standards. And uh, we needed that also in order to make our systems work better in order to, re to receive the refugees, because we simply couldn't cope with that many in such a short uh, period of time. But the right to asylum is really fundamental. And when we see the challenges of the world today, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, solution is not to build walls around Europe and hope that the rest of the world would disappear or something like that. We need to make sure that people are really taken uh, out of poverty, that, they, that we have to work for peace and security, and also prevent new conflicts from appearing, and, and kind of helping where uh, we can build really resilient societies. We can do that through politics, uh, diplomatic efforts, but to, through development cooperation, but also, not least important, through trade, financial policies, all those everyday decisions that every government in Europe and around the world are making all the time, that we cannot contribute to more poverty or corruption 
or inequalities because this is not sustainable and we're all feeling the consequences of unsustainable policies uh, that has been going on for, for hundreds of years in the world now. And now we have the chance to, to address that. Let's talk about money for a moment. We know that Sweden's money that's destined for foreign aid is being used domestically to deal with asylum seekers. Is this a worrying trend, money that used to go to foreign aid being used in developed countries? That's right. First of all, I'd like to underline that Sweden is one of the very few countries in the world that are actually de dedicating 1% of our gross national income to development cooperation aid. Out of that, we decided last year that no more than 30% uh, of that could go to uh, the costs of receiving asylum seekers in our country. So that means that we're still more than 0 0.7, which is the UN target, providing development cooperation outside of Sweden. But, I mean, of course it's a worrying trend if we're seeing uh, development aid being used for other purposes than actually uh, helping in, in the countries where we can contribute to real development. But I also think there's another worrying trend, and that is that more and more of the aid provided goes to humanitarian aid, that is, emergency aid not long-term cooperation, not lifting countries out of poverty, but actually providing blankets, tents, food, water, protection to people that are fleeing from wars. And this is something the world really needs to take seriously now, to work with the forgotten crisis, the fragile states, the countries that are not in a conflict now, but that we can see all the signs coming, coming up. Because we can't afford, I mean, a country that goes into conflict means, you know, it's thrown back uh, ten decades, generations of development back in time. And it will take generations for it to recover. And so many hostilities and so much human, uh, uh, let's say, suffering, but also hatred and, and these types of feelings that will not go away for such a long time. We can't afford that. So we need to look at the obvious places where we see that, okay, so these are not countries that have been stable for a very long time. We need to support them now, like the Central African Republic, like Somalia that is slowly, slowly coming out of, uh, of its long, long uh, time of complete, complete destruction and uh, support these countries uh, while they're not in the everyday news headlines. Mm -hmm. But we need to see where this is happening and, and actually um, address uh, the, our economic uh, resources and, and channel them that way. Now, you're also the climate uh, minister. Uh, Sweden recently set 2040 as its objective for 100% renewable energy. That's right. But it also opened the door to more nuclear plants and using nuclear energy. If we agree that nuclear is not renewable energy, how is this compatible with the overall objective? So it's very important to know that uh, what we also agreed, and this was a cross-party agreement, uh, so it's very stable, uh, it will last, so also the opposition uh, agreed on this, is that we're not going to subsidise nuclear power anymore. But you're going to eliminate the tax? The tax is just a small, small, uh, let's say, uh, issue in, in, in the whole context because security demands on, uh, on European nuclear has been risen quite substantially since the Fukushima accident. So the, the actual increase in costs that makes it very, very uh, un, un, let's say, sustainable for the nuclear industry now is the investments that they need to do in order to live up to the new security uh, demands. And uh, so we don't, we don't expect, and no one, no serious uh, analyst is expecting that the nuclear industry will be able to, to build new power plants because, or new reactors because it's simply too expensive. So you've and opened the door but you don't expect it to happen? The door was already open. We didn't open it. We just confirmed that it's, it's, still, it's still legal, it's still possible to, to, uh, to create new reactors if, if there would be financing for that. But we, the, the taxpayers are not going to finance that and the industry needs to take the responsibility for, for also the waste. 
uh, which makes it extremely expensive to do that. And also, in the light of uh, renewable energy, prices have gone down so quickly. At the same time, the prices for nuclear has gone up. So the, pri the, the price of uh, uh, solar energy has gone down eight times the last, uh, I think, five or six years. And in the meantime, the nuclear uh, costs have gone up. So, I mean, it's, it's not going to be sustainable. So as part of the Greens, you're hoping to see renewable energy pot pot um, take over when nuclear could have stepped in. Uh, yes. Now, as you mentioned earlier, peace and security is often an underlying factor in all of the overall development goals. We know Sweden is vying for a non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council to be voted later this month. Why should it go to Sweden? Well, because uh, we are really friends of, of uh, global governance, of the UN, and we've really proven that over a long period of time. As I mentioned, we give 1% of our gross national income to development cooperation, and this has been the target and the goal cross-party, unanimously almost, in the Swedish parliament for decades. And we're doing this. We're one of the biggest uh, donors to the UN system, the fifth biggest donor to the humanitarian system, even though we're just a very small country. Um, so, And it's been more than 20 years since we've been on the council. Of course, we pay, we're engaged, we're, we really think we have something to contribute with. We have a feminist foreign policy. We think that uh, gender equality is really uh, a core issue if we're going to attain world peace. <laughs> we need to involve women. can't really exclude 50% of the population. We, th we are real promoters of fight against climate change. So all these issues we think is, are really key and core when it comes to discussing security issues and it's our turn. Minister Lovin, many thanks for joining us here on France Van Gat. Thank you for being with us. Stay tuned, there's more news coming up.